Hey, if you are, if you are a veteran, you're here today. If you would just stand, we'd love to honor you. You've served our country, or you're serving our country. Would you? Let's thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, remain standing. Remain standing. Um, we got another veteran coming right through the door there. So come on, come on. Dear Father, we thank you for these. Uh, people that have led, leaders, Lord, that have led our country, that have served in wars, have gone overseas, that have um, uh, guarded uh, our homeland, Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, thank you for um, their lives. Thank you that uh, we have men and women that have committed themselves to laying down their lives to give us the freedom to worship, to be here today. And Lord, uh, this this isn't our home. Heaven is our home. But Lord, for the time that you've given to us as exiles here, America is the place we live. And thank you for uh, these men and women that have guarded this territory, but also have helped other countries. And Lord, thank you for them. Um, we pray a special blessing upon them, Lord, right now. You men and women can be seated. Let's continue to pray. Father, we thank you for our country. We thank you for um, another election. We thank you for a, another season that has come where we can uh, vote and we can um, also now submit to the authority that you've given to us, Lord, as, it sh as you appoint us to be men and women that submit to the leadership, no matter what it, what it is at the time. And Lord, uh, Lord, I pray for people that are here today that uh, maybe their, uh, their propositions didn't pass. Or their senators or representatives did not win. Or maybe their president did not win. Lord, I pray for those that this was a good week for them. They're excited for the results, Lord. Ultimately, Lord, as we are in this series in First Peter that you give to us, we recognize the fact that no matter who is leading us, Lord, ultimately you're in charge and you're in control. And I thank you for being a sovereign God and for um, giving us a life forevermore. Lord, as we continue in this series in First Peter, we're just reminded that we are exiles. Our home is with you. Our citizenship is with you, purchased by your blood, Lord. Thank you that we can call ourselves sons and daughters. Lord, I pray for people that are here today, maybe for the very first time, that um, they can lean into your word and lean into the worship, worshiping you, Lord, and worshiping in spirit and in truth, Lord. I pray for uh, the team that is leading us today, Lord, that all of our focus is on you, King Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the honor it is to worship you here today. We're going to continue to worship, and if you're a guest of ours today, there's a card, and you can take that card and uh, turn that into next steps, but uh, today is going to be a wonderful day of worship as we, we, we focus on His Word. If you don't have a Bible today, you can already, you got 10 minutes to go get a Bible. There's Bibles on either side, and if you don't own a Bible, you can grab one, and you can already start turning to 1 Peter 3 as we lean into God's Word today. Good morning have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7 this morning. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen. 
Thank you so much for being here today. It's Veterans Weekend. I hope you have some plans, maybe a barbecue or something. I'm so glad that so many people are here today. A Veterans Day weekend. If you're a guest of ours, I'm so glad that, that you're here. And uh, we celebrate your being here by reading that scripture of submitting to your husbands. We're going to jump into that. No, it's just a joke, guys. It's a joke. But we are going to talk about that today, give some insights. You know, at our church, we, uh, we do something called expository preaching which is, uh, to explain that, it, it, it means that we go through the Bible and we don't necessarily uh, think about, like, what do you guys want to hear? Uh, what would maybe bring in the crowds? What, you know, what would, like, leave you, like, talking on, you know, at lunch about how good the sermon was, how that made you feel? We just go through the Scripture. And so what we do when we do that, it's expository preaching, when we do that, Sometimes it lands on, on passages that you may not necessarily want to hear about. But here's what it does. It takes the weight off the pastor, and it puts it on God. You got a problem with this passage? Take it up with God, okay? And uh, does that sound good? Turn to the person next to you and say, take it up with God. Okay, remember that on your way. I may even ask you to do that on the way out. Just remind yourself once again. I look forward to this passage. I don't, I'm excited about this passage for a lot of different reasons, but um, mainly because it's the Word of God. And sometimes we don't understand things. Sometimes are, things are preached in a way that you may have remembered 20 years ago. Maybe you heard it and you're like, oh, I don't like that. Oh, here it comes. This is a terrible one. No, no, no. This is a good one. Best way to lean into Scripture with God is to say, God, just show me what you want to show me in this so that I can walk this out of my own life. And uh, before we jump into the passage, I encourage you to turn to 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 Peter 3, 1, and uh, we'll lean in. I might want to take off, turn off your phones too, and, um, and allow ourselves just to kind of let the Word of God sink in. That's why I love bringing, the, bringing Scripture and looking into Scripture. It kind of helps us to really focus and tune out everything else that's going on. Um, before we jump in, I also want to encourage you to be praying about... Um, Christmas Eve coming up. We're going to be meeting Christmas Eve this year, and already ahead of time, I want you to know the last Sunday of the year, I think it's the 29th, we will not be meeting. We will not be meeting. The last Sunday of the year. We're going to meet Sunday, and then we're going to meet Christmas Eve. That'll be two services that we have that week, so I want you to plan accordingly, and I'm telling you in advance so that on the 30th, you don't say, where were you, Pastor? Okay, so last Sunday of the year, we won't be meeting here. But you can meet together with your family and, and meet together with friends and celebrate. Um, also, I also want to remind you, as we head into the Christmas season and all that, if you would like to help in some way, maybe you're attending our church and you'd like to serve, you can take that card and just say, hey, I'd like to serve in some capacity. And you can just put service on there. Also, you could take that card and maybe even be specific. On Friday nights, we have set up from 6 to 7. Sometimes it doesn't even take that long. We have about five or six people at 6 to 6.45. If you can give us one Friday every six weeks, that'd be awesome. It'd be great to have about seven or eight people on a regular Friday routine where you can be here and, and serve. So if you can do that, um, just put on there. Maybe you say, you know, I'd rather not do that every six weeks, but maybe every three months I can do that. Just put on there and say, Fridays, okay, on the card, just Fridays, and you can turn that into the next step. Say, you ready to jump into this passage? A great passage starts off, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. What a way to start. But I think it's important to note this, circle this word, likewise, likewise. This chapter starts off referring to something in the same way, that's what that means. That's a very important transition in the same way which means it's referring to something in the past and for those of you that may not have been in a small group we're not going to rehash it but i'll give you a little review it's referring to everything we discussed this week in our small groups there are three relationships of submitting and this is the third of three the first two it talks about the submission of uh, authority an unjust government under the control of an unjust master, it says, which can also be just a really bad boss. What do you do in situations when there seems to be some unjust activity? What am I supposed to do? So the context of this is he's talking to, to wives, 
And predominantly, these wives have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and their husbands have not. All right? The context is everything. And he's saying, okay, so you got an unjust master. And the unjust master at this season was probably Nero. Do your research on him. No matter who you voted this last Tuesday, they were better than Nero. And it says you're going to submit. Submit to them. And then it says also with um, your boss. This, in this passage, it talks about slaves, masters. Back then, slaves weren't the same as we had you know, when you do your setting. It wasn't the same thing. Many of them chose to be slaves. So it's a different dynamic. But for the most part, you had some bad masters. So you can apply that to how you work. You ever had a bad boss? Yeah, some of you are like, right now. Gives a great... And so like, likewise, in the same way, wives, be subject to your husbands. And what's interesting is, as you go through this passage, Peter throws some things in here that may not even be recognized by the governmental authorities, yet he starts talking about husband's honor honor your wives. That's a, that's a new one in, this, in the New Testament context. Back then, you didn't have to honor your wives. But he's saying, this is how you do this. You honor. In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, it talks about how this subjection works in all three relationships. For this, for to, to this, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus, he's talking, referring to Jesus here in 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges, judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. This passage says that Christ did three things in the face of injustice, and I'm going to briefly over, give an overall uh, view of this because many of you have already talked about this in your small group. But number one, he was patient. He was patient in the midst of being beaten and abused. Is there anybody on the face of the earth that has ever been treated so poorly as Jesus Christ? Jesus was treated by so much injustice and spat upon and, and rejected, took on our sins, took on the sins of humanity. And in the midst of this, he was patient. When he's being accused of things and being um, assaulted, and when he is being mocked, he was patient. He was patient. By the way, I want to step in here and say this. Some of you have already gone there. Does this mean that women can just be beaten by men? No. I'm going to say that right up front. We're not talking about a bullying, abusive man or woman. If that's happening, I encourage you to talk to somebody at Next Steps and we will get you some help. Call 911. We're not saying you stay in a relationship of that. But here's what Scripture is saying. Jesus did do that. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was bullied. Jesus was abused. And so he's giving this comparison to say... Even your Savior who did nothing wrong submitted. And I want to tell you, he wasn't submitting to the government when he was beaten. He was submitting to his Father in heaven. Jesus, they didn't do anything that Jesus didn't willingly give. Jesus could have called upon legions of angels to take him off that cross. Jesus submitted to his Father in heaven and did everything that he said. And he did that so that we might be saved. So when Christ was facing injustice, he was patient. He committed himself to God the Father who gives full justice. In other words, while he was taking this beating and abuse, anybody that does that to Jesus and does not accept Jesus as Savior, God will deal with someday. God will deal with. So people that mock Christians and, 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 and hurt Christians and beat Christians all around the world... We let God have the final say. Vengeance is, is, is God's. He can do it. What we're called to do is to love even those that persecute us. But trust me, we serve a, a just and gracious God. Isn't that awesome? He's in charge. We're not. So he committed himself to God the Father who gives full justice. And third, he kept doing good. Even when he was being slandered, 
Even when others were wrong, wronging him, he kept doing the right thing. Jesus knew that God was watching. Know this, when you're in a relationship, either by a governmental official or a boss or even a spouse, know this, God's watching. He's watching your actions. He's watching your activity. He is watching to see how you are uh, loving and showing the Christ-like example. Then it says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. By the way, if you have braided your hair today and are wearing gold jewelry, we'll get there. You don't have to hide it. But let your adorning be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Question here for ladies. How do you submit? How do you be subject to a husband in a Christ-like way? This passage, which in Peter's mind is a, is a wife with this unsaved husband, because that was really common in this early church. And he says that by loving him and subjecting yourself to him, you are doing it so that you can you can win them to Christ through your conduct. By your love and your grace, you win them to Christ. The husband looks at you and says, how in the world can this woman just put up with me? I mean, at some point, they said, how in the world does this happen? And this woman draws this man to Christ by her actions and activity. I've seen this done countless times. I've seen men do this to women that are unbelievers. Just by their love. Women are like, why are you going to church? Why are you wasting your time? And men have said, listen, I'm, I'm going to go to church. This is not saying that women and men cannot go to church and worship God. There are certain lines you draw at that point. I knew a lady that was, in, for 20 years, her husband did nothing but just call her names on her way as she goes to church. And one time, she was on her way to church. He took every Bible in the house, threw it out there, took all her clothes, threw it out there. He says, if you go to church, I'm getting rid of every Bible, and you can go find another place to live. She did. She had to go find another place to live for a few weeks. That man came to know Christ and was one of the godliest men you'll ever meet. And they've been married 56 years. Isn't that awesome? Jack and Diane Stenziano. They made a song about him, Jack and Diane. No, I'm joking. That was another song. But incredible, incredible man of God now. But the things that he used to do by her love and her reaching out to him and showing, just, just loving him, loving him, loving him, women praying for him, he came to know Christ. First Peter 3, 7, likewise husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. But ladies, this question is, how do we submit to our husbands? And first of all, there's men, there's a question for you going into this is, how do you show honor to your wife as a Jesus follower? Some men don't know, have a clue of how to, to do this, and uh, it's, it's a struggle. And I just want to tell you, man, sometimes being married, just bottom line, is hard. It's hard to figure out women, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I'm not trying to be mean to ladies. It's hard to figure out. You are such intricate creatures. It's just amazing. And sometimes we're just like focused on one thing. And, and, and so you, know, you just have to, let me give you just a couple of things. If, you're, if, you're, if your wife comes up to you and says, do I look fat in this? What do you say? No, there you go. We're on the right track. You're late somewhere to dinner. And she has shoes on. And she says, do these shoes match my dress? What do you say, man? There you go. Now we're moving right along. I'm not saying lie. I'm just saying there's some, there's some, uh, we have spent hours, hour, doing shoes and changing shoes and all that and all that. And I've learned this over the time. I'm just sharing my 25 years of experience. That's about all. Those two, that's about all I know so far. 
When I get to 50 years, I'll have some more things for you. But that women are intricate. And there are some things, though, that we are to learn about them. And I think what this passage is doing is it's helping men as we honor them. It's really to study your wife and learn how to love her. Study your wife and learn how to love her more and more and more, how to serve her. This passage actually is on the man more than the woman. As you look at this, three ways to honor your, in your marriage. This is for men and women. Number one, use your power to serve, not control. And we all have power in this relationship. Men, of course, have physical power for the most part. Not in all marriages, but the most part, men are stronger than the women. Physically. Now, you can go into all kinds of theological paths in this passage. I don't think you need to go too deep. I think it's just talking about men are we're stronger. We're stronger. You know, we live in a day and age where you're seeing that. You're seeing men that like, can't really make it in their own sport. They've jumped over and they're like, I'll just take on some women. You're a man. You're stronger. You should not be putting boxing gloves on and hitting women. That's wrong. You can call yourself a woman, but you're not. Right? It, it just doesn't work that way. Now, that may be controversial, not controversial to God. He creates men and he creates women. Men are stronger. Women are weaker. I don't believe this is talking about weaker in other areas. I think this is just, that, hey, men, take care of your wives. You, you were created to be there and to take care of her, and, and, and she's weaker in that. And so it, it's important that men understand to, you're going to use your power to serve, not control. To serve them as a weaker vessel. They are heirs with you in the grace of life, it says here at the end of the day. It says at the end of the passage here that they are heirs with you in the grace of life. She is an heir with you right alongside you. She is your full equal. Men, turn to your wives if you're with them and say, you're my full equal. You're my full equal. Go ahead. I know it's hard. You're my full equal. You're equal. It's not lesser than. You're equal. Peter says that whatever power that you have been given in that relationship is to be used to honor your wife. The power that you have is to honor her. It is so beautiful when a man that is stronger serves the wife. Wouldn't you agree, ladies? Amen? When a man that is, is stronger physically and stronger in life, that you serve your wife. It's not, it's not saying anything more than that, I believe. I think men need to... Sh to, to to limit yourself and to serve, to learn them, to learn how they function. There's a great book by Gary Chapman, Five Love Languages, and um, to learn their wife what their love language is. What is your love language? I'm going to give you some of them. Words of affirmation, gifts, that's another one, acts of service, time, physical touch. I'm going to give it to you again if you're writing them down. Love language, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, time, and physical touch. Men, you should know which one of those your wife really leans toward. Typically, all of us have two. By the way, you don't use those love languages to use it against your husband or wife. You know? Hey, honey, we'll be romantic tonight, but you got to do your love language. That's how it, you don't use it in manipulation. It's just learning who they are. We're all made up differently, right? So you may want men to have like a special night, dinner, and candles. My family, no matter how many candles there are or how dim the lights are, if that kitchen's dirty and I cause the mess, no. I mean, it's just not going to, she's not using it against me, it's just it's not there. You can light candles all you want, but her love language, I'll tell you what, if I go out and clean up and I pick up dog poop, She's like, wow, you're the greatest man in the world. Awesome. Acts of service. Acts of service. And I used to think it was gifts, you know. I, I, you know, we'd go on cruises and do stuff. I'm giving these gifts, but I'm there as well. And she realized it took me a while. It took me about, about 20 years to figure this out, that this is a gift to her. Now, I can't be involved in that. Like, I used to like to give her gifts, but I'm attached to the gift. No. I can't buy her a car, and then I drive the car can't take her on a cruise, and I'm there, and I'm, I say, it's my 
gift. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go on cruises and all that. I'm just saying that this is how we function. I'm learning. I haven't learned, but I'm learning how to honor her. And one way to honor her is to learn who she is and how I can serve her. I can serve her. By the way, we are one of those couples, though, where she's a little bit stronger than I am now. She can, like, sometimes I'll say, can you pick that up, Jessica? So I'm just saying that we throw out the stereotypes. She's pretty strong. But I need to learn who she is. I use my position of power to serve her because that's what Christ does with his strength. He lowers himself. The creator of the universe lowers himself and serves. The picture of him having a basin and a towel washing the feet of his disciples before he goes to the cross. Is Jesus powerful? Man, the greatest man that ever lived is Jesus. He is the greatest example for you. When you're in doubt of how to be a man, always look to Jesus. Don't look to your dad as the perfect example. Don't look at a culture as an example. Look to Jesus. That make sense? Write that down. Take that to the bank. C.S. Lewis says this, the crown of a man that he wears in marriage is first one of thorns. We lay down our lives for our wives. We serve our wives. We, we wash her feet. When I say that, we serve her. We do whatever we can to honor her. And the reciprocal of that is that women will agree to this and submit and be subject to that leadership in the family. How easy it is for a family to work when a man is laying his life down for the wife and the wife is subjecting herself to the husband. And that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of agreement. It may not be popular in society, but that's how it works in the Bible and in God's plan. Try it. Agreement. Agreement. Wives, it talks about this agreement that happens. Tim and Kathy Keller. Tim passed away a few years ago, pastor of a church in New York. Uh, years before they went to New York, they were serving, and I think it was in North Carolina, and Tim and Kathy were talking, and, and Tim sensed that he was being called to New York to plant a church. He talked to Kathy about it, and Kathy was, um, Tim was just a wonderful husband, loved, loved Tim, and so she's talking with him, and he's like, I think God's calling us, and she goes, I don't sense that, Tim. So they waited a few more weeks, and they prayed about it some more, and he goes, I really sense that God's calling us to go. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow what, what God's calling you to do. And he said, no, you don't want to go. He backed off. And they had an argument about agreement. Like, no, we're going. And finally, Kathy was like, we're going. I want to go because I want to follow you. You're a godly man. You know where we're headed. And so they went. And boy, those of you that know Tim's story, aren't you glad they went? What a wonderful, dynamic picture of Kathy's saying, you get the deciding vote, but we're going to argue. It would be beautiful if marriages were like that, dialoguing back and forth, sensing the direction of a marriage, and finally, in those situations where it really matters, the woman saying, hey, you get the deciding vote on this. I want to tell you, man, this is how you do it. Most of those decisions in life, especially preferences in life, which would be like 90% of them, hey, give it to your wife. What color do you want on the house? You decide. Where are we going for dinner? What do you want to do, honey? Like, just serve her. Love her. You know, our family, when I was growing up, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but my folks are in heaven now, and I think if my dad was sitting right here on the front row, he'd say, I'm glad you used that illustration. In my family, this is how I was raised. This is why you have to just submit to your culture. My culture said the man gets a decision in most things. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet you some of you grew up that way too. Dad comes home, get out of his chair. Remote. And my family growing up, it was a long time before we had a remote. But when we got one, guess who was in charge of the remote? Dad. Certain games on, it's whatever Dad wanted to do. We weren't watching Hallmark, I can tell you that. That's how it was. And he'd sit there sometimes, godly man, he'd pray and all that, and he'd serve the Lord. But in this, in this generation that he was in, when this cup 
was empty. He just shake it. You know what that meant? Fill her up. I know we're laughing. I used to laugh too. But now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, I don't think that's the way necessary to use your power. Shaking a cup? My mom would do it too. She'd come fill it. And that picture, I say this to say this. This is the picture of a lot of our fathers. And I just want to tell you, we probably need to let that one die. We need to serve our wives. Best thing I can do is say, honey, around November 20th, what Hallmark movie do you want to watch? And let's watch it. And it's okay. And you know what's in the, in the midst of that, some of the things that she chooses, I grow to, to love. And many times, I'd say more times than not, the decisions she makes that I agree with in those are the right decisions. This is a different day and age, but you know what? This is actually a biblical way of living your life. The Bible teaches that. Where is the honor in that? They just call it what it is. On the flip side, ladies, we live in a day and age where sometimes the woman runs everything. And you just let your man do whatever he wants to do as long as he's out of the way. Maybe your culture's that way, that the woman is the boss. And that's not the case either. And Peter is addressing this. He's talking about submission, and he's talking about adorning me, the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. Go back to 1 Peter 3.3. 3. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Unfortunately, we live in a day and age where women have used sexuality and what you look like to control, to manipulate, to cover up maybe something that's going on deep inside, maybe turmoil and anxiety and worry. And therefore, what we do is we, we portray this external rather than an inner relationship with Jesus Christ himself. And so he's saying, listen, yeah, he's going to lay down his life. He's going to honor. He's going to be, but, but ladies, we must not use who we are and our physical beauty as power to get what you want. And there have been situations where that's happened in life. What is valuable to God is a Christ-like character, a calm, steadfast faith in him, a quiet spirit. This does not mean that you have to be introverted and shy and never get to talk in public. That's not what this is saying at all. It's, it's saying a quiet, deeper spirit. You can still be extroverted. It's okay to be extroverted. But you can still be extroverted and have a quiet spirit. This, isn't, this passage isn't talking about your personality as much as it's talking about inner peace and strength. Submission with a quiet spirit was a core dimension of Jesus' character. That more valuable to God than beauty or, or anything else that you might adorn yourself with. Ladies that are not married, speaking to us as well. He's speaking to those of you that have uh, an idea in your mind that what you do on the outside is, and what you look like on the outside is more important than what's inside. And as you move into potentially dating and all that, I want you to, to know that men really do find it attractive for women to love Jesus with all their heart and to have boundaries and to not always just flaunt it because you're hiding something deep within. Maybe if it was written today, and I don't know, and I don't take liberty at this, but maybe today it would be more like don't cover yourself with filtered Instagram photos. Talk about braided hair and all this. What are you portraying to the world? You want to look good. You want to, you want to be out there. You want to be seen as beautiful. The reality is Peter's saying there's a, there's a beauty that's deep within you. And when you have a woman that is, is honoring God inside and a man that is laying down his power physically to serve, you have a beautiful picture here of what that looks like. So married ladies, you don't use your sexuality to get him to do what you want, to withhold sex, to, 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 to power over him of what you want. You'll do this, this, and this, and this, and then, no, that's not, that's not how... A marriage works. That's not how we're to act. 
Christ-likeness in marriage means you use your power to serve, not manipulate or control. Number two, in all things, do good, obey God, trust him. This picture of, of Sarah in Scripture, I think we have verse 5 there. Let's see if we can put it up on the screen. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You may not want to try that one at home today, guys, okay? Let, you might want to ease into that one. There. He's just calling him Lord, right? He's talking about submission there. And you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. Wow, what a powerful verse this is. This is. Do not fear anything. Sarah is, is leaning into this man, Abraham. By the way, Abraham was not a perfect man at all. He blew it many times, but he led his, he led his family, sometimes in places they shouldn't go, but, but he also walked by faith and led his family. And that is a, a thing for all of us men to know that we don't have to be perfect men, but we do what we can to walk by faith. And Sarah is submitting to him. She didn't fear what was frightening. It's an inter- interesting phrase. There's something about a man that is powerful, that lays his life down for his wife and is there for his wife, that allows his wife to walk in worship rather than worry. There's something about a man knowing his wife and serving his wife and protecting his wife that allows her to move away from trying things and all the time, trying, 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 to move into trusting and walking by faith. And I still put that on the men. In marriage, it is there's something about that. Your wives aren't having to fear anything that is frightening because you're able to walk in faith. Kathy Keller's statement is so powerful. I'll let you decide. I'll trust God. I will follow you, Abraham. Peter's point here is whatever situation you find yourself in, you must continue doing good and trusting God. Third, grace is more powerful than getting even. Go back to verse 7 there. Likewise, husbands, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, we're walking together. We're enjoying life together. You're giving grace to one another. You're in mutual agreement together. Where you live, how you serve, in areas of sexuality, in areas of decisions with your children, in areas of life and death. It's a journey of grace. And you walk together in grace as the man submits and serves and honors his wife and the wife submits and serves God and God alone. And you see this couple walking and you realize, oh, this isn't so much about a power thing going on in the marriage. It's about two people submitting to a holy God and moving forward in agreement. We see it with government. We see it in church life with leadership. We see it at work environments. And in this passage, we see it with husbands and wives. And get this, as you look at other passages in Ephesians, this model actually is reciprocated with the kids as they obey their their mom and dad. And they see this as you walk it out. They see how a man should be, not this. Not this, but serving and loving. And then men, they see see the mom, and the mom is in times of struggle where decisions are being made. They say, you know what? You make the decision, honey. I'm going to follow you because I know you love me. And that young boy sees that, and you know what that young boy does? I'm going to marry somebody like that someday. And the girls, the little girls growing up, they look at the dad, and they, they see going to church together. They see the husband going and spending time in small group and serving the community and sometimes going on trips to serve God on mission teams and sometimes even setting up on Fridays. And I'm not trying to get you to sign up, but there's something something to seeing a man serving God through the local church. And the daughter says, I think I want a godly man. Boy, that guy's got a nice car. That guy's got a lot of a lot of money but I want a godly man. And you do that marriage to marriage, family to family, community to community, 
you see a different country. Trust me, though, this is living as exiles. Nobody from the world is going to cheer you on. As a matter of fact, a life like this, they're going to call you weird. They're going to call you names. They're going to berate you. That's okay. Our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. And it'll all make more sense when we get there. But right now, we subject to the Lord. We subject to governing authorities. We subject ourselves sometimes to situations in the work environment. And sometimes, ladies, you have to subject yourself to an, an unbelieving husband. And I want to end with this. If you're here today and you're, not an unbel- you're an unbeliever, there's no need to walk out of here as an unbeliever. There's no need for you to live one more day as an unbeliever. Men and women that are here, have you ever given your life to Christ? I encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. That life of Christ will change your life, change your marriage, change how you you parent your kids as well. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this message from you. We pray that it is this seed that's planted in their hearts will will grow like all of your words. And Lord, as we come to uh, remembering what you did for us on the cross, may it be maybe even a time today where men and women confess things to you. Maybe some people here today have been following their culture and their past and how their moms and dads lived rather than you. And Lord, may we say no to how we were raised and say yes to your example in our marriage and in our lives. As we come to the table, Lord, we love you and we thank you for shedding your blood for us represented in these glasses and for giving your body that was broken represented by this bread. Lord, as we come here today, we're saying to you as we come to the table, we remember what you did and we love you with all our hearts. We pray this in your name. Amen.